Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today's episode is part of the Best Of series, where we highlight some of the most exciting and enthralling and enlightening episodes from the archives of the Psychology Podcast. Enjoy. Today we have George Bonanno on the podcast. Dr. Bonanno is professor of psychology, chair of the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology, and director of the Lost Trauma and Emotion Lab at Teachers College, Columbia University. He's the author of The Other Side of Sadness and The End of Trauma. George, so great to finally chat with you on the Psychology Podcast. It's great. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm happy uh, to, to you invited me. Thank you. You know, we have uh, a lot to talk about, and this topic that you study is uh, is extraordinarily germane to the moment that we live in. It's interesting because I think that uh, if I read your book correctly, you said you started writing it before the pandemic hit, so you almost had to kind of add that extra chapter at the end about the pandemic. Is that right? How did that How did that come about? Yes. Well, I, w- I was working on the book, and I planned to be in Europe. Uh, for a sabbatical and touring around Europe and giving lectures and working on the book further. So I started the book and I was going to do the, you know, do the bulk of it. And then the pandemic hit and I had the shuffle on home right quickly. So mm-hmm. I thought, okay, this would probably, it would probably make sense to include this whole experience in the book as it, as it began to become clear that it was going to be a long haul. So I began um, keeping a diary that was a, a fortunate decision because then the last chapter of the book is about the pandemic. Yeah. It, yeah. So it's good that you kept the diary, right? Yep. Um, well, before we get into your seminal work on resilience and um, the latest ideas in your new book, let's go back a second because we both shared a mentor, uh, Jerome Singer. Yes. Right? Yes. So, yeah. you know, may he rest in peace. Let's talk about uh, that work you did with him a little bit and, and how it, how did it lead to work and interest in resilience? Well, well that's a very interesting question. Um, how do you go from daydreaming to resilience? Yeah, well, I didn't do daydreaming no, work with, with Jerry. I worked on um, really personality and experimental, um, but there is a connection. I worked on personality and experimental psychology. Um, with mm-hmm. Jerry. And um, my dissertation was actually a, a very, um, a set of studies on what's called dichotic listing, the, the, the different inputs into each year. And it was very um, intense experimental. I was in the lab a lot creating stimuli, you know, and, and by the end of that experience, I decided, and this is how it led me to, to what I do now, I decided I wanted to switch directions. And I had a chance to to go to England, to Cambridge, and do some further experimental work. And I decided, no, I wanted to get closer to what, to to really my clinical training into a more applied areas. And then I had an offer from Marty Horowitz, who was a, a, one of the original uh, founders of the whole idea of trauma out in San Francisco. And um, and I it was introduced to Marty through Jerry, through Jerry Singer. And um, and so I knew Marty through Jerry. So Marty Marty Horowitz offered me this position out in San Francisco, a very nice position. Um, and he was conducting bereavement work out there. And I um, he was asked if I would basically come out and run this study that he was doing, this new study, like be the the kind of organizer of it. And I was very I was a little confused by all that because I was really not interested in bereavement. I didn't really know much about it. But this is where the work I did with Jerry really came to the fore. But Jerry always used to say, where's the data? And that really was emblazoned in my mind. And when I began to look in the bereavement literature, I found myself saying, where is the data for these assumptions? A lot of assumptions about bereavement didn't make sense to me. And as far as I could tell, they had no empirical basis. So when I took the position in San Francisco and began to um, develop this study, and we had a big team and we had, it was well funded, so it was really kind of fun to try to work it out. So we just, it, you know, the more I looked at the literature, I thought there's so much I can do here and test these ideas, and test um, really what the rest of psychology was doing with the methods I knew about, mm-hmm. and that started the whole thing because we designed this longitudinal study. We, we got a, a, a broad sample, you know, pretty much everybody, you know, anybody who lost a loved one, it wasn't just limited to people seeking help or a clinical sample. And right away, we found abundant resilience. We didn't use that word yet, 
Mm. But we, you know, and but we we saw it, and we, you know, we didn't know what quite to make of it, and we we were very. I think I I was a little reluctant about where we would publish this and how it would be be responded to. But we were able to publish this work in, in some of the top journals in, in mainstream psychology. We continued to do that work, and eventually I, I you know, shifted over to doing trauma work more broadly. But it really all came from this whole idea that, that I learned from Jerry Singer, mm-hmm. where's the data? That is so cool. You know, I never heard that story before, so I'm glad I asked you that question. <laughs> and and it's it's nice to think that Jerry played a, a helping hand in the seminal resilience research. I never even knew that, you know, yeah. he could, he contributed to it. Um, so I, I do want to ask you, you know, why, why is the conventional wisdom about trauma so wrong? That's a great question. I think it, it I think there's at least three sources um, that led us to somewhat astray. I mean, there was, you know, trauma has a really curious history. There, there was hardly any mention of trauma in the historical record until really the 19th century, which is very mm-hmm. interesting. But then once it really, once it kind of, began to take hold, then it, it really became a crucial issue and a you know, very, um, uh, I'd say, controversial and you know, tension-filled issue until 1980 when the diagnosis was first, the PTSD diagnosis was first formalized. Mm. And then it really took on a life of its own. And I think one of the main factors that we sort of got on the wrong foot was that a lot of the um, research and certainly a lot of the writing about trauma came from a clinical perspective. So people who worked with trauma patients, researchers who worked um, with severe trauma and PTSD, there was a lot of interest in, in uh, understanding and treating PTSD, which makes perfect sense. But that led to a kind of a skewed view. When, when, when people work with PTSD, they begin to think that everybody must be traumatized because that's what they see. They don't see resilient people. They don't see people who have gone through a potentially traumatic event and, you know, basically, you know, been okay, they don't see those people. So the, 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 the news from that area was that PTSD is, is really prevalent, and it's a, this difficult, intractable problem, which eventually that, that, that work paid off and that good treatments were developed for PTSD. Mm-hmm. But that news sort of trickled out into the general public trauma is really a PTSD is a common response, very common response. And of course, the media played its role. It's a good story, right? And so that was a kind of a story that 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 made its way into the public. And I think so the second factor is the media. And I think the third factor is that um, human beings, we want a simple story. You know, we don't want a complicated story. We want it. We, we, you see this now with the internet, we want memes and sound bites. So these three things conspired, I think, to, to, to the idea that trauma leads to PTSD, that these, you know, the, the really undesirable, even horrific things people go to are going to cause PTSD in a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, you say in your book that uh, PTSD was invented, and you go through the yeah. whole history of that, and you say, quote, the PTSD diagnosis with its various subcategories is one of the most complicated and heterogeneous diagnoses out there. Can you explain to the general audience uh, what that means? Yeah, sure. Lot, there's a lot of jargon in there. Yeah, so um, the, the PTSD diagnosis has, has um, had originally three subcomponents. First, you have to have the – there's an A criterion – you have to qualify as having a potentially traumatic event or a traumatic event. And that criterion has been a bit of a Pandora's box because it started out fairly um, uh, uh, pro- prescribed boundaries of a th- really something outside the range of normal human experience, something really unusual and really difficult. And it, But then as people began to um, to to say, well, we had clinicians began to say, well, we have patients who clearly have PTSD, but they don't have one of these events. So we need a broader criteria. And that be, the definition of that A criteria began to expand, which was a bit of a Pandora's box because yeah. it's now clear. Now we have this ambiguity about what is and what is not a tra- traumatic event. After you get over that hurdle, then there are three subcategories. And it's a bit of a menu-driven approach. You need one of these and three of these and two of these, et cetera, from these different categories. And um, that leads to a kind of almost impossible number of combinations of possible symptoms so that one person may get the diagnosis and have these cluster 
as long as they meet those criteria. And another person may have these cluster. And you can literally have hundreds of thousands of these different combinations. So it, it looks like, you know, pe too, many people can have the PTSD diagnosis and have very different profiles. That got even worse with the latest incarnation of the DSM, the, the, the basically the, the, the um, Bible of mental disorders that the American Psychiatric Association puts up. The DSM made it, uh, created another subcategory. So now there's four, which increased the number of possible variations. So that's a that's a real problem because you have too much heter heterogeneity simply means too many different variations. Yeah, that that's for sure. Um, and you found that that resiliency is not necessarily the opposite of psychopathology. Yes, right. And I yeah. think that's interesting um, because uh, some people kind of may view them as opposite ends of the same pole. And so I'd like you to explain that, and also explain you know how resilience can come across in um, sudden, unexpected ways. Well, so the 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 idea that resilience is not necessarily the opposite of psychopathology, PTSD. In the work that that I've done for the last twenty five years, we 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 follow people over time, and we use we use my own data and other data we can get our hands on, and we we look for patterns over time, and we find that there's a handful of these typical patterns. One of them is chronic psychopathology. But what, what I like about that is that having a defining as a trajectory is we don't need the PTSD diagnosis. And, and the PTSD diagnosis has many flaws. So we have this diet, we can, we can identify a pattern of chronic psychopathology that's really just a trend in the data, irrespective of the diagnosis. Then we identify a pattern of resilience, which is really, we call it a stable trajectory of healthy functioning. We find that the majority of people typically, after a potentially traumatic event, they are able to basically get on with their lives and function pretty well without a whole lot of symptoms. They're able to have positive experiences, you know, be close to other people, um, you know, work and concentrate and, and have joy in their lives pretty soon after the event. So for, it varies, but sometimes it's a few days afterwards, sometimes it's a few weeks afterwards. Even though they were pretty shaken at the time, they were able to dust themselves off as a, as a decent metaphor and move on. But those are not the only two patterns. We also find some people who have a lot of trauma symptoms early on, and they struggle sometimes for months, and then they gradually begin to get better. So it might take them a year or two. We find that pattern. Then we find another pattern where people maybe have a, 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 a fair amount of PTSD symptoms or other symptoms, and they're struggling, but then they're not getting better, and they sometimes get worse over time. And we know that can be caused by any number of things, like maybe there's an injury that, that doesn't get better, and or maybe they get depressed about the fact that they they are not getting better, or or reasons that we just don't know yet. And so those are all different patterns, and, and the only one of those patterns that maps on the PTSD is the chronic trajectory. So there's a lot going on, and it it, it simplifies it too much to say there's just you know, one or the other. Yeah, and, and most importantly, you say, quote, in almost every analysis, the resilience trajectory was the most common pattern observed. That's yes. groundbreaking. I mean, that's groundbreaking. <laughs> yes, and, we, and we've been breaking that ground. I mean, I, I like to think it's groundbreaking. I don't know if everybody thinks that, but we've been showing this now for about 20 years. Thanks, Scott. We've been, we've, been, <laughs> <What it's worth. laughs> we've been showing this for about 25 years, and it mm -hmm. has gotten a lot of traction within the profession. And, you know, it, it, it's really been sort of, I think at this point, it's almost irrefutable. We've just shown this so many times. And one of the studies we did, we, we reviewed all the studies. I think we've re reviewed 67 different analyses that showed the same thing in all kinds of different events. And the, the mean across those events was about two-thirds. So about two-thirds of the people in all those different studies uh, showed this resilience pattern. It is really the norm, the norm, the, the most common pattern. That's really, uh, yeah, really important to, to note that. I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self-actualization coaching intensive. While the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence-based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. 
For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org. I look forward to welcoming you in December. Now, your work predates the work in the field of post-traumatic growth. I noticed that you don't talk about the post-traumatic growth uh, research too much in your new book. I'm actually just having Richard Tedeschi on the podcast on Monday. So, it'd be nice for him to follow your episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, can you just tell me what you think of the post-traumatic growth literature? Be honest. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. um, and tell me, you know, like, in a way, aren't you kind of like one of the founders of the field inadvertently? Like, I know that you don't explicitly work in that, but I wanted to ask you, like, don't you see yourself as uh, laying a strong foundation for that work? Um, I don't know. I'm a little ambivalent about the concept. And I think in part, um, this is back to show me the data. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, basically people report growth, but it's hard to know what that really is because the people typically reporting growth are the people who show the, the most severe symptoms. And um, there are some studies that measure growth a little bit differently and I do find evidence for it. And, and to be honest, it's hard to believe that there isn't growth from these, you know, growth from adversity. Um yeah. And, you know, I've experienced it personally, and I know there's some ways that we can show it, but I think the common, um, the way it's commonly measured, and again, I get back to data, the way it's commonly measured is seriously flawed. Ironically, I was in an airport where a flight was delayed, and I sat down next to this man in the airport. We started talking. We we're having the greatest time talking. And um, I asked him who, you know, at one point we got around to introducing ourselves, and he was Richard Tedeschi. <laughs> and um, he was a super nice man, right? And so he, and, yeah. and at that time, I was openly critical of the concept, um, and he mm. knew that. <laughs> so it was kind of funny that we'd sit down together. But you know, I, I, I just to, to to say it more briefly, I, I think it's real, but I think we don't know how much, and we don't know what it really is yet because we haven't been able to to track it or tap it so well. Well, on first blush, it looks like your research program and findings are very well aligned. Although, I suppose I should ask, what is the difference between resilience and growth? I mean, yeah. that's kind of the key yeah. thing, if we can really operationalize those two. Yeah, so I actually wrote a paper once called Post-Traumatic Growth and resilience, two sides of the same coin or different coins. I think that was the title. That's exactly what I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, I think that resilience is not – the way I, we look at it is not post-traumatic growth. It's basically okay. people going back to where they were, in a sense, before um, before the event. They're doing well before the event. As we track people before and after events, they're doing well before an event. Something happens. There's a little perturbation, a little disruption for maybe a couple of weeks, and then they're back to being okay. Um, I don't think it's necessarily true that some of those people haven't grown um, but it, but I don't know. I, I don't think we actually got at, got at that in a very good way. We haven't. We don't know how to measure that. Is what what I, my assumption is. So gotcha. that's what that's the um, the way. That's how I, I think of it. That they're they're not they don't necessarily overlap, but at least for some people they might. Gotcha. That this has really helped me understand <laughs> the differences and similarities between your program and their and the post traumatic growth program. That's actually yeah. the topic of my next book, <laughs> is post traumatic growth. So I'm really trying to think this through very thoughtfully. It is true that there's a lack of studies that have a control group that can actually. I mean, it's hard to have a control group within person yeah. for these kinds of post traumatic growth things. You can't obviously bring a. A, a, a someone who's died, you can't bring them you can't back. Do that. Control yeah, you conditioning, can't. you know. So it's uh, it's tr it's it's tough to to actually scientifically answer that question. Would they have been, you know, are they better off uh, in in terms of some areas of growth than if yeah. they didn't 
have the situation. Um, so yeah, so the jury's still out, and uh, the science, you know, let's listen to Jerome Singer. Uh, you know, the, let's let's look at more data. I will so, say, yeah. I will say, sorry if I can add one more thing. Please I just do. Went, I just went through a fairly difficult time with a, a surprising neurological problem that took me off guard, and at one point it was looking very serious. Mm. And somehow during that, during dealing with that. I had these kind of series of epiphanies where I realized I'm going to be okay. You know, I can, I can use some of the tools I've worked with and some of the tools I've written about in the book and just cope with this one piece at a time. And then I was almost, almost happy at that point, you know, mm -hmm. and I really, I realized this is really a kind of a growth experience. So mm -hmm. in this adversity it was definitely a growth experience. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that, that people really mean when they talk about growth and, and and I'm not sure we get at that, but I you know I, I think that's that's real. You know that kind of thing is real. Well, I certainly think so, and I think that uh, <laughs> uh, humans, in a lot of ways, need to overcome adversity in order to have meaning in their lives. Yeah. Uh, we don't really get terrible meaning from statically positive experiences. Yeah. Although maybe we do, maybe we do, but not to the same sort of degree. Yeah, uh, not flavor. to the same degree. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, or flavor. Um, so what is the resilience paradox? Okay, the resilience paradox, which um, is very, um, I don't know if happy is the right word, excited may not be the right word, but that was, it was an important turn for me. I've been trying to understand this for years. So we know, we know we can identify people who show these resilient outcomes. They're resilient to these highly aversive events, these potentially traumatic events. So we can identify those people. We can identify the things that correlate with that outcome, the things that happen early on. You know, we can we can measure things right at the time the event happens. We can sometimes, if we have the right kind of data or the right kind of study, we can identify what they were like before and what, what characteristics and traits and behaviors they had and see if that predicts or correlates with that outcome. And we find we find a lot of these things. So, you know, you often read about the key five traits or the, you know, the key seven traits, the magic bullets of resilience the magic traits of resilient people. But when we study and try to identify the different things that correlate, we find more than five or seven, we find lots of them. And we, other people find lots of these and we keep finding more. So you have all these things that correlate with the resilient outcome. Mm. And, um, you, you know, and, and they, they correlate but then when we try to use those things to actually predict, so who's going to be resilient when this next thing happens based on these traits, or even when it happens, we now measure these things, certain traits. Who is going to be resilient based on these traits? We find that we can't do it very well. It doesn't predict much. So in the statistical terms, the effects of each one of these, these factors is very small. Essentially, what, it, what we're saying is that if you have one of these things, gives just a little bit of a greater chance of being resilient. It moves the needle just a little bit of being resilient. And if we think of it as a pie chart, which is I like to do it that way, you know, resilience is a pie and the things that the factors that the traits of resilient people, whatever you want to call them, are slices of the pie. And these are very small slices. So that's kind of the paradox. We know what correlates with resilience, but we don't, we're not very good at predicting resilience based on these things. Very interesting. I mean, yeah. I would argue that the characteristic um, neuroticism is it's quite strong, isn't it? Uh, negatively predicting resilience. Um, I don't think it's quite strong. I mean, it, it, wow. it correlates pretty regularly, but it, the correlation is probably, I don't know, small. Um, neuroticism, though, I think, I don't know if it's a trait. So that's, uh, you know, not likely that people are not likely to be as resilient as neurotic. Um, I don't know if we've measured that one, but um, it's even the things you would think like optimism or social support, social support, you know, to be able to rely on friends and relatives for, for emotional support and succor. Yeah. That's a real common trait, a real common, um, you know, resource to have that's correlated with resilience regularly, but it's never that big, right? Um, when you look at the, you know, statistical terms, again, the variance explained mm -hmm. the amount of, of the likelihood of being resilient that we're actually we're actually explaining with that. And I've puzzled over this from for years. Thought maybe we need to add them up. Maybe we need to have a lot of them. You know, 
Um, and even yeah. recently, we've been able to do machine learning, you know, where we take a bunch of these things, 70, 80 variables, we have people's blood, you know, so we can, uh, I don't mean to sound gruesome, but we have, you yeah, know, know, we have people's, we can, from blood, you can measure immune functioning and stress levels in the blood and all kinds of other things. And when we have all those things together, we do a better job when we have lots of these things, like 80 different factors, you do a better job of predicting results. But then we break it down. In one of these studies we published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, when we break it down, we find that um, if we only use the biological factors, we, we lose a lot of our predictive power. If we only look at the psychological factors, we lose a lot of predictive power, even more predictive power. And even with 80 together, we're still not doing really well. We're doing pretty well. Um, and it's harder to predict resilience than the other patterns because resilience is a large, um, it's a large group of people. So there's going to be a lot of different kinds of people in that group. Um, so, I mean, normally we don't have access to all these hidden things in our bodies and all these many different variables. So normally we only have access to a few of these things. So it, the individual factors still don't tell us much of the story. I think that is very, very interesting and puzzling. Yeah. I, I try to understand how that dovetails with your argument uh, about the three aspects of the flexibility mindset, yeah. optimism, confidence and coping and a challenge orientation. Doesn't that contradict what you said? If you, if you're making the case, there are at least three things that are important to cultivate. Aren't you making the argument? Those three things are important. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a great point, Scott. It's a great point. Cause, yeah. uh, cause it does sound like I'm contradicting myself. But the, the flexibility mindset, there are two pieces. So my, 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 my answer, which I finally began to realize to how we were able to be resilient despite this paradox, is that mm -hmm. it depends on the situation. Every situation is different. We have to kind of, we have to, we have to embrace every situation and in a sense um, work it out. And we have to really get into those situations when something happens to work it out for what's happening in this particular situation. And what works in one situation doesn't work in another situation. And the, even when you, we find something that works in the situation we're facing, maybe the next day it won't work as well because the situation's changed. So there are two pieces of this flexibility process. The flexibility is how we do it. And there are two pieces of this. And one is the mindset I call the flexibility mindset, which is comprised of optimism and what's called challenge orientation. It's it's thinking of of, of difficult situations as challenges rather than threats. Uh, we might initially think of them as threats, but when we, we then shift to this thinking, to an appraisal of them as, you know, this, what do I need to do here? What's the problem? And then the third piece is being confident in our ability to cope. Mm. And these are probably not the only way to, it's probably not the only way to have this mindset, but it seems to work really well for what we know now. And the reason that, say, optimism, which is one of the things that correlates with resilience, the reason that that's useful here is because it doesn't make us resilient. What it does is it, it, it contributes to this mindset, which sort of gets us going. It gets us into the game. The mindset really helps us to, to you know, efface the, the, this potential trauma. Because the potential trauma and the, the things it causes in just about everybody, you know, it's disturbing. It causes nightmares, and you know we think about it when we don't want to, and we're we're a little bit on edge. That's a very common response, even among resilient people. We have to kind of deal with that, and when we have those reactions, the last thing we want to do is sort of face it head on and think about it. But when we do that, we then a lot of lot of this other process happens, a flexibility sequence. But in order to do that. We need to face it. We need to sort of get ourselves into the game, as I like to put it. And this combination of, of optimism, uh, confidence and coping and challenge appraisal kind of work together to make us do that, to help us do that. They, they tell us, you know, I can do this. You know, I'll be able to do this. It'll be okay. Let me just get in there and do it. And that's how those, those processes work. They don't make us resilient, but they, they kind of get us into it, get us rolling. And that's a big difference. We still may not be resilient, and we still may not cope okay until we do the rest of it. I think I, I think I see what you're saying. You, you're making the point that 
it's uh, more, the flexibility mindset is more than the sum of its parts, and the, the yeah, synergy yeah. the synergy of these three are important. Yeah. Now, is that has that been empirically tested? That hypothesis, like in the sense, like if you want to get nerdy for a second, like um, statistically, have you put these three in a sort of multiplicative sort of way um, within a person? Um, let's get nerdy. I like that. Um, yeah. Do you see what yeah, I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, we we've 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 only done it certain ways and, and, and basically what we know about these three is that when they're together, they, they influence each other. So optimism mm. gives people, people become more confident. And this has been done largely with a, with a, a technique called path analysis. So you try to say, nice. okay, what leads to, to less depression or less PTSD after this event? So optimism then makes people more confident. When people become more confident, they also become more optimistic. When people become more confident, they also t- tend to be more likely to see it as a challenge. When people see it as a challenge, they become more optimistic. When people see it as a challenge, they become more confident, too. All these things tend to, to work together. And, and in the book, I argue that they, they have this synergistic effect. And, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, that would be, it'd be nice to do more research in that, you know, but um, I'm just, you know, those are questions for for further work, you know, there's certainly a lot of research that can be done on all these things. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I think that it's a, it seems like a very reasonable hypothesis and yeah, I like the, I like those three things. I mean, I, I want more of them in my life if I could turn up the lever <laughs> <laughs> manually and I could choose three, yeah. they yeah. would be in my top list <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Well, tell me, you know, unpack a little more of the flexibility sequence. You started to talk about it, and, but I think there's more to the sequence than what you mentioned. Yeah, so, far, so, right? so we do that. We do that. We the mindset gets us going, as I mentioned, and I, and I just want to repeat that. If some people are not so optimistic or they're not so confident or coping, it doesn't matter so much. I think the mindset is what matters. And as long as people can generate that mindset, I can do this, you know, or I will do this. Let me just figure out how to do this or what do I have to do here, right? So, um, you know, I, I want – and it's really the, the act of embracing this stressor event, this this potential trauma, sort of head on. It doesn't mean, you know – diving into it, it means really just thinking about it a little bit. And this gets us into the flexibility sequence. It had, the flexibility sequence has three parts. And so, I mean, the basis of flexibility is that what I call flexibility is this capacity or this, this process, I should say, of working out what's going on in a stressor. You know, um, I, this, this potential trauma has happened to me. It was an ugly event. I'm now thinking about it. It's popping into my mind. I feel bad about it. You know, I feel it's. I feel like I'm in, at da- in danger. I feel maybe humiliated. Um, you know, I just had a nightmare last night. I can't quite work it out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on edge. You know, am I traumatized? I'm traumatized. That's a common assumption. So, mm-hmm. but if it, that's a that's a thinking about it as I'm you know in that terms I'm traumatized. This is going to be bad in the future. That doesn't get us anywhere. Instead, if we think about the fact that this happened, there are these ugly things associated with these things we don't want to think about, but they happen to us. And it's, it's making us very unhappy in the moment. They're making us, it's finding, we're finding it difficult to, to get on with our lives. So what is it that's happened to me? What is it that, that I need to do here? And if we think about that, we begin to see at least some kind of answer, at least for the, emo- the immediate moment in this situation. What are these nightmares about, or what you know? What are these images that are bothering so much? And when we see, when we think about that, we can then think about what can I do about it? What is it that I need to do? And we might decide, okay, I need to find a way to get this off my mind, or maybe I need to talk to people about it, or maybe I need to, you know, get out of the house and you know go for a walk, or maybe I need to just somehow clear my clear my head. Whatever we think about. Um, that whatever might seem appropriate. Then we move to the second stage, which I call repertoire, which we kind of say, okay, I need to to distract myself and clear my head from this so I don't think about it so much. What do we have in our repertoire that we can do that? You know, Mm -hmm. people vary in the skills that they have. So what do I have in, in my repertoire that will enable me to sort of meet this challenge? And then we try something. And that leads to the third step was where we then evaluated. That's called the feedback responsiveness step. We just say, okay, I tried, say, you know, distracting myself. Did it work? Is it working? 
um, you know, if it is, let's keep doing it. Or, you know, um, if, if it isn't working, let's maybe modify it a little bit or try a different way to distract ourselves. Or maybe we need to, you know, try something completely different. This didn't work. Maybe what I need to do is to talk to my, my friends about this. Or maybe what I need to do is give myself some time alone where I can really think about this. Or maybe what I need to do is, you know, in, get engaged in a task that's, that's more fulfilling for me. Or, you know, we, we go through this process. We might, this is, I think, in some, on some level, is very simple. It's a process of working out how to solve the particular problem we're confronted at that moment. And, you know, maybe later there's another problem. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm distracting myself a little bit. I feel a little bit better. But I'm still frightened about what happened. Maybe I need to, to learn about it or read about it or, you know, or maybe just, um, you know, spend time with really close friends who make me feel safe, you know, whatever we think about. And mm -hmm. in, instead of thinking, how will I not be traumatized? We're thinking instead about right now, what's the thing that I need to do right now to take, to take on just a piece of this? I think it makes it more manageable. It gives us a sense of we can actually do this. And as we, as we manage little pieces at a time, we do begin to feel like, okay, I, I, I've got this. I can handle this. You know, and it, it's a, you know, the next day it'll be different. Maybe, you know, the situation changes. There might be something else, but, you know, that's, I think when we break it down, these pieces and, you know, take it kind of one step at a time, we move forward. What incredibly important research you're doing well. Uh, so, I mean, how do people become flexible in the first place? What are the, you know, genetic environmental determinants of that? Yeah, well, um, I don't know about the genetic because um, we haven't looked at that yet. We have looked at the genetics of the trajectories and we, there is a genetic piece to it. Um, small piece like everything else. But um, first of all, we have to think about, well, how do we become flexible, as you just said? Um, in the book, I have a chapter on, on the developmental piece to this. And in fact, we learn to be flexible. Everybody learns to be flexible to some extent as they grow up. And some of the research that we've done, we found that most people are already somewhat flexible. You know, and that was a, I was very happy to see that because we're arguing that most people are resilient. And, and I've been arguing that they do this by being flexible about each, you know, each event at each time. It, we better find that most people are flexible. And that is what we found in a couple of different studies. Some people are extremely flexible, but most people are at least moderately flexible. So the way we, this happens in development is each one of these pieces has a kind of a developmental trajectory. For example, being sensitive to the context. We sense the problem. We call that context sensitivity. But it turns out you can, you can actually see this just in, in thinking about development. There's research showing all these things develop slowly in people. But think about context sensitivity or reading the situation, like what's happening now? What do I need to do now? And this classic example with children is they go in different situations, their caregivers and their teachers teach them how to read the situation. You know, for the famous line, um, you know, almost infamous is that what you say to a child, you use your inside voice here. You know, essentially, the, uh, whoever's telling that, the, the, the child, the teacher or a caregiver or somebody else, you're saying, mm -hmm. in this situation, you have to be quiet. And so children begin to learn, oh, this is a situation when I, when I have to be quiet and, you know, and behave. And this is a situation I can just run loose. And this is a situation where I have to be polite. In this situation where I can stick my finger in my friend's peanut butter sandwich because nobody, you know, whatever. I'm in the cafeteria. And I grew up with lots of brothers, so I know about this. Um, and this is a kind of a, a through the course of development, as our, as our brains develop, we get more cognitive skills. We really learn to yeah. read the intricacies of situations very well. And we do this to the point where it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overlearned behavior. You know, it's an overlearned skill. In other words, we, do, we get yeah. to we do it so well, we don't even know we're doing it, um, which I think is why. And the same with the other pieces. You know, we learn different um, coping behaviors and emotion regulation behaviors. And we learn to pay attention to whether they're working or not. The reason I think it's important to name it in this book is because most people don't even know they do this, you know. And so I think we can use this more effectively in our lives when we know this is actually the process. And we can, mm -hmm. we can also shore up any deficits we might have in any of these things by, you know, by thinking about it directly and practicing it and, you know, see if we can improve these things. 
Yeah, one thing you talk about that's very helpful is the importance of goal directed self talk. Yeah. Um, Can you? Yeah. So yeah. So self talk. There's a lot of been a lot of work on self talk. We all sort of talk to ourselves, and sometimes we talk to ourselves out loud. And often we do this again without being aware of it. But self talk is a very it's very effective, and it's um, it's very um, uh, a nice way to 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 be able to access things we do. So one of my favorite examples is you know you're you you're trying to do something really difficult. Like I, I think in the book I use the example of make a difficult basketball shot or prepare a really kind of um, elaborate meal for guests, but you don't for your guests at, at your home, but you don't quite know if it's going to work out okay. And then it does work out okay. And we might be thinking to ourselves, wow, I wasn't sure I could can, you know, make this recipe and make this basketball shot, but I put a lot of effort into it. I'm usually pretty good at these things and I took a chance with this and they seem to really like it. That is the thoughts going on in our head. But we then the, concretize these by saying to ourselves, you know, privately, yes, you know, or something along those lines, you know, something simple like that. And, um, and that's basically self-talk. Yes. Um, you know, we can also, it can go the other way too, where we, we, we crit ourselves, criticize ourselves, you know, you idiot, you dummy, what made you think you could do that? And that's, those are examples of what's called automatic self-talk. We don't, we're barely aware we're even doing it, but that condenses a lot of co- things going on in our brains into a simple phrase. But then um, uh, intentional self-talk is when we actually use self-talk to, to remind ourselves or to help ourselves um, do something. So there are lots of self-talk that we can use for this flexibility mindset and flexibility sequence. For for example, optimism, uh, a great piece of self-talk would be like, it's going to be okay. The future is generally always okay, and this will be okay too. This will pass. These are common things people say to themselves. It will eventually pass. It will eventually recede into the background. It will be okay. Confidence and coping, you would say, you know, you know, you can do these kind of things. So, so you know, you'll find a way to do these things. Um, a challenge appraisal, you know, we might say to ourselves, so what really is the challenge here? What do I need to do? And the same, I think that sort of bleeds into the, the flexibility sequence. The, the self talk for the flexibility sequence might be like for the context sensitivity is, is kind of what I just said for challenge appraisal. What's happening here? What do I need to do? What is it that's bothering so much? Me bothering me so much, and then the flexibility sequence. Uh, I'm sorry. The the repertoire part is what am I able to do? What am I good at? What can I what can I use here that I am able to do? And then the last part, really, the the, the feedback part, the part where we sort of decide how it's working, is basically simple. We just say, is this working? Is this does this seem to like? Is the problem still there? Did I, did I do it? And those are, you know, in the, in the book, I, I listed a chart of these sort of basic self-talks for these for the sequence and the flexibility mindset, and then a few other examples. And then, you know, I, I suggest people can make up their own if they're not comfortable with these. And, of course, there's another kind that um, uh, Ethan Cross has done a lot of work on, on what's called um, distance self-talk or objective self-talk. Mm-hmm. And then in that mm-hmm. case, you talk in the third person. You use your own name. So you might say, you might say, for example, you know, Scott, you can do this. Or, you know, Scott, you've done mm-hmm. this before. You know you can do this. You know, things like that. And that's very effective, actually. Yeah, I think that relates to, like, Kristen Neff's research on self-compassion, mm-hmm. she often says, treat yourself, you know, uh, like you would treat a friend and say, be like, Scott, you know, like, I love you, you know, <laughs> you can do this. Yeah. 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 And I think also when you speak in, in to, about yourself in the third person, there's a certain kind of, uh, you can applaud yourself much more easily mm-hmm. in a sense or, you know, or, or remind yourself that you can do things. You have done things, and you're good at some some things. You know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, are there any other uh, tips for being able to boost your flexibility mindset and your the the whole sequence that you're talking about, um, other than self talk and what you've talked about already? Well, I think um, one of the things we've learned that we haven't used this this whole thing in any kind of training or intervention yet, although some colleagues of mine have and mentioned that in a kind of a loose way. One of my colleagues, uh, Wendy Lichtenthal, mm-hmm. who's um, in the book I talk about her, she's a she's a, a really 
really terribly talented cl- clinician. She's really good. And um, she works with people under great duress. And um, she has been experimenting with trying to, you know, talking about them, the flexibility sequence primarily. And, um, you know, so having people step back a little bit and think about the sequence. And again, you know, it's it's really focusing on what's happening in the moment rather than the, 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 the whole, you know, broad spectrum, which is often looks really bad to people. Instead of focusing on the moment, what you can actually do, and before you know it, you've actually gone through a lot of the pieces that won't make it so it won't be so bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you know one of the things, one of the insights she had was when you're right in the middle of something really, really difficult, it's a little harder to, de- to develop or improve any of these skills. And I think of them as skills. So I think it would be really a really um, a, a very um, a uh, uh, good way to, to use this this work is to is to do this sort of in our daily life, you know, and to start to begin to think about, you know, what's happening to me right now? Why am I so upset? Which is, you know, we're off, often upset about little things through the course of our daily life. And, and I found that remarkably when I started thinking about how to teach people to do this, I started using it more in my daily life, you know, or you know, I'm I'm unhappy with something. You know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a, a parent. I you know I have financial woes or financial stresses. I'm a, a chair of a department. Mm-hmm. Um, I you know I um, you know I do all the other things. I live in New York City. You know where you're liable to get you know on the subway. You're liable to encounter some strange situation. All the, you know at any moment, and sometimes those things are deeply upsetting, and you find yourself feeling really bad and you can then at that point just say okay what's happening why what, what's really bothering me about this i know this this guy said something to me or you know insulted me on the subway or you know but what what's really bothering me about that and what can i do about it and, you know what am i able to what are, what are the ways i can deal with this and you know trying out things and that's it's very effective because you begin to learn more more you know learn better how to use these these skills and also to improve them if you need to we there, there's a lot of research showing these individual pieces can be improved that's good news that's good news yeah <laughs> in, in everyone um i would think so i mean you know the um i think we what we've what we found is that the people who are not doing well in their lives typically have deficits in one of these areas, not all of them, in one of these areas. That was a kind of an unexpected finding in our research. Mm. So I think if we dis- we try to use these different processes and these different abilities in our daily life, we might quickly find out where we have the, the sort of the weak spot. And then we can try to work on that part. And, you know, and we, we, we can think about it, try it, you know, delve into it a little bit more. And I think, I think all of these things can definitely be improved probably in anyone, I would say. Mm. Well, okay. Again, that's good news. Okay. Yeah, and, and, yeah. Did you want to say something? Oh, I don't know. You know, I mean, that's not anything we've ever tested, but I, I'm confident about that. I think for most people, it's probably there's within their reach to improve, especially if we know, if we can identify where we have our weak spot, then we can focus on that. How much has your research made contact with the work on hope? You know, like Sheen and Lopez's work on hope. Um, not at all, as far as I can tell. I mean, we, you know, we've been very busy, and um, you know, there's a lot of room. We're always looking to expand in different directions. Cool. Um, you know, yeah, and you know, I mean, where I'm going in the future is really this flexibility sequence and the mindset. Try to unpack it more and learn how it works and. You know, when we first proposed these things, it wasn't that long ago. I first proposed the flexibility sequence about eight years ago only. And, um, and at the time, I thought, well, if this doesn't last, it means that somebody's improved it. And it's still kind of the, the way to think about it. And it still has mileage of still getting me places, you know, I'm still trying to understand it better. But I'd be happy if this, you know, progressed in a totally different direction or simplified or got more complex, whatever it is I want to find out. Mm. We're going to be studying that in the future, I think. A true scientist. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the data? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and then there was a global pandemic. That's the title of your last chapter. Yeah. Um, so, the pandemic hit while you were writing the book in 2019. How did the resilience blind spot, first of all, what is the resilience blind spot? I don't think we ever defined that. Yeah. Um, and then how did that show itself during the pandemic? 
Yeah, that's. I'm glad you asked the, the question, Scott. So um, the resilience blind spot is what happens when we're exposed to potential trauma. And it particularly becomes a blind spot when we have a, a mass trauma that is exposed to a lot of people. When we feel, and this, this, when we feel bad about something, I mean, when we feel really upset, it's hard not to think that it's going to last a long time. This goes back to the social psychologists like Dan Gilbert. And a lot of people know Dan Gilbert from Daniel Gilbert, from his wonderful work, from his wonderful book, Stumbling on Happiness, mm. which is just a really excellent book, very readable. And, you know, he had done all this wonderful work on affective forecasting, which basically showed that when we feel bad, when we feel fear, when we feel anger, it doesn't feel like it will go away in 20 minutes or an hour. It feels like it will last you know, for days and weeks. And the same thing when we feel positive things, we, it just seems like it will last forever. So mm -hmm. when, when, when a, a traumatic event happens, a potentially traumatic event, as I like to call them, it feels like, oh, my God, we're, I'm traumatized now. I'm going to be this way for a long time. And I, I have many friends who have told me this same thing, you know, when they, they've been through something and they, they, they start having nightmares and start having intrusive thoughts and they're anxious, that they're traumatized now. And that's, that's just basically not true, at least not in the first week. That's really just it's a normal reaction. And those reactions can be useful, but it's at that time that we can really do the work of moving on and getting beyond it. And, um, but that's the resilience blind spot, that when, we, when we're feeling these emotions, we can't even see resilience. And when it happens on a mass scale, say with the, the COVID virus or 9-11, we... Um, we, we begin to think everybody's going to be this way. And, yeah. and I wrote about this recently in an article in one of the major newspapers. I think it was the Wall Street Journal, if I can name names. Mm -hmm. um, and I basically talked, it was on the anniversary of 9-11, on the, the 20th anniversary, and I called it the, the, the lessons learned from 9-11 and the lessons we keep relearning. And 9-11 was a, was a perfect example of this. You know, 9-11 was a horrific event, obviously. And it, I was in New York at the time, and it was really a distressing event. I was having nightmares. I was, you know, on edge like so many other people in the city. But the predictions, you know, the research began, studies, surveys began to um, happen, you know, within days of 9-11, and they, they predicted a very dire outcome. You know, huge portions of the population were feeling distressed and anxious. People in New York were already showing PTSD symptoms, lots of people. And it led to these sort of, you know, announcements um, that, you know, we're headed for an enormous mental health crisis. And the, the, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, um, allotted well over $100 million. I don't remember the exact amount. It was well over $100 million to New York. So New York could provide free therapy to any and all comers. And it, if, you know, a few months later, a lot of those, that distress and those trauma systems disappeared or they, they were gone. People weren't feeling that anymore. And people didn't want the psychotherapy. And, uh, or, you know, the, the treatment for 9-11, the emergency treatment, and they hadn't spent a lot of the money. So initially they spent it on advertising, you know, like it was essentially saying, come on, you really know you need treatment, but it's, you're afraid you're mm -hmm. stigmatized. I don't remember the exact wording of these ads. I'm paraphrasing, but it still didn't happen. And, and a lot of therapists were confused and, you know, were trying to find customers. And But people were basically kind of over it. I still remember I mentioned this recently, I forget where I mentioned it, but about a month after 9-11, I was on the Columbia campus with my children. And there were no airplanes in the sky because all commercial flights out of New York, mm -hmm. in and out of New York were, were stopped. The only thing we saw were military jet fighter planes in the skies. Mm -hmm. And it was disturbing, you know, not to see these airplanes because where I live in Manhattan, it's in the flight path. So either the planes are flying up the Hudson to the east, I'm sorry, to the west or, you know, up, the, um, up Brooklyn and Queens to the, to the east or right over my head in Manhattan. And no, there were planes in the sky. Then about a month later, an airplane, a commercial airplane flew right over the campus. And I looked up and I felt this surge of, of I don't know, um, relief. And I looked around and everybody on the campus was looking up at that plane and showing this great surge of relief that I was feeling because that plane signified we're getting back to normal. You're back. Yeah, so yeah. The blind spot was, in a sense, tells you, no, that's not going to happen. So, um, mm. 
when the pandemic hit, I was actually um, in, as I mentioned, I was in, um, I think I was in Norway at the time, about to begin my, my trip around Europe on a train, and I had to come home. And I returned to New York, and I had to quarantine. And I was, I was, I have to admit, I was annoyed by that. I was, I was pissed. I was because I had to quarantine, and I, you know, I felt like, come on, I was in Norway. They're not. They're only. There, there are fewer people in Norway than the entire New York City, <laughs> right? And, and, yeah. and you know, nobody was really at that time taking the virus very seriously. But then yeah. during my quarantine, by the time my quarantine was over, two weeks, the entire city was in quarantine. By the end of the month, about three or four weeks later, we were up to about 800 deaths a day in New York. It was just shockingly horrible. Yeah. And around that yeah. time, you know, there was a refrigerator truck, a makeshift morgue right down the street from my apartment. There were hospital yeah. tents, makeshift hospital tents in Central Park. And, you know, nobody was out in the streets. It was, you know, I used to ride my bicycle a little bit later, right down the middle of Times Square. That was just the strangest thing, an empty Times Square. And at that yeah. time, say I'll say in early April, there were all kinds of, of again, the same lesson from 9-11. There were all kinds of uh, pronouncements that we're headed for an enormous mental health, cri health crisis that we're not equipped to handle. And um, I decided, I thought, well, that's the resilience blind spot. That can't be true. It's bad and people are suffering, but it, this will we'll, we'll get used to this and we'll deal with it because we always do. And so I wrote a piece for um, the Association for Psychological Science website. They had asked me to do this, just some of the points that, uh, that they called it an expert commentary. I was flattered by that. But they, they, you know, being that I study resilience, they asked me to, to, to say, what does psychological science tell us about this? And I made some of the points I've made just discussing with you right now. And I again said, we're going to get through this because we always do. And in fact, we, we have, you know, there, everybody is, I think, a little, is still stressed out. It's a, it's a long-term stressor. A lot of people have had, including myself, have had physical problems that are, that are basically not tied to anything, but they're clearly stress-related, you know, um, small pains or, you know, small difficulties. That my doctor told me there's so many people coming in now for these unexplained physical problems. These are stress-related problems. And we've had, been under this kind of stress for a long time, but we have dealt with it. We have coped with yeah. it one way or another. You and I are talking right now. We're on Zoom. Um, we're not on Zoom. We're on SoundCloud. But Here we're we talking um, and we're dealing with it and we're having a decent conversation. I can see your face and you can see my face and yeah. we're smiling sometimes, you know. I mean, we're, we're getting sometimes. by, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, that's, I think, that's the lesson. And I think we'll learn this again the next time something happens unless we start paying attention to, to this pattern. Absolutely. And hopefully the tools in your book will also offer people a good toolkit for dealing with any sort of future things that arise, so. future yeah, challenges. So. George, thank you so much for your really seminal work in the field. I am a great admirer, as you know, of the research you do, and, and I really believe in the importance of it um, now more than ever. So thank you so much for chatting with me today and for the Scott, work you do. Thank you. I, I thank you very much for this conversation. It was very nice to talk with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the psychology podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.